And our co-host is Lisa. Say hi, Lisa. We will be your vision hosts this afternoon. Welcome to Distance Education Virtual Learning Platforms and Technology for Students with Visual Impairments, Teacher Swap Shop, and Non-Digital Options. Today's session will be recorded and shared through the PASS Project YouTube channel in the coming weeks. This session is also live captioned. Out of respect for the other attendees, participants will be muted. If you have a question, please type them in the chat box. We will share those questions with the presenters at the end of the session. In, er in order to receive ACVREPCEU, you will need a beginning and ending code for the session. The beginning code is SWAP, S-W-A-P. Our presenter for this session is Katie Crawford, teacher at ISBVI. Take it away, Katie. Oops. Hi. Um, now, I don't teach at ISBVI. Um, I'm with Clark Pleasant Community School Corporation on the south side of Indianapolis. And, um, and I'm really just facilitating this session. So um, I'm going to share my screen. And hold on just a moment with me. I was having some technical difficulties. Nope, that still isn't it. Julie doesn't give me everything. That's all right. Ah, there we go. Maybe I'm pressing it. Okay. Pardon me, everybody. I thought I had it set up and then, okay. There we go. Um, so this, this PowerPoint is, um, in um, uh, it's a Google slideshow and it is in the um, in sketch. I've made a couple changes to it and we're going to do some editing to it as we go because um, this is an interactive session to get your guys feedback. So after we've edited um, the document, we will reshare it so people can go back to it as a resource. So as she mentioned, this is distance education, virtual learning for students with visual impairments, and we're focused on teacher swap shop and the non-digital options. So what this session is not is a formal presentation. Um, it's gonna be more of an interactive, you guys helping problem solve um, with each other, opportunity for us to talk about um, what we're struggling with, frustrations with virtual learning, and then opportunity to share with others your strategies and a chance to brainstorm with everybody else to, to find solutions and, and share them with one another. Um, so we've talked about distance education, no matter what you call it, distance education, virtual learning, e-learning, connected learning, or different districts are calling it different things. Whatever it's called, how do we make it work? How do we make sure our students have access? What are our options when something isn't accessible? Um, how do we provide services in our highly specialized field while still virtual? Those are a lot of questions that um, have been going around. For example, you've got students with different needs and they're all on different platforms, particularly if you serve multiple districts. Um, I'm fortunate now I only serve one district, Clark Pleasant on the south side of Indianapolis, but I previously was with a co-op that served many districts and often they are using different platforms. Um, so you might have, I have an example of four completely different students that might be on your caseload and have different needs and different platforms. So Jill is a student with low vision and her school's using a Chromebook. She's at home due to chronic illness and her school is live streaming in-person classes. And in my district, that is what the middle school and high school are doing. They are live streaming what is going on in the general education classroom and students are joining in that way. Um, and you can think about for a student with a visual impairment, what problems that might cause um, if a classroom teacher is just teaching via their Chromebook, um, being able to view what's on the board and things like that may be very difficult. Um, also, what might've worked on a standard sized Chromebook in school, now that they're virtual and needing to see more at once may be challenging. Um, Second student that kind of 
these are not real students, but um, second situation will be like Rick, he's a student with CBI and multiple disabilities. And his school is doing all their coursework through distance learning on Apple devices. And what instruction do we provide for Rick? How is he included in the general education classroom if he had been a um, essential, essential skills student and been pushed out to some classes, but then also receiving services in a specialized classroom? How is he receiving services? Um, Abby, Abby's a beginning Braille reader um, and her, her school's using a hybrid model of two days in person and three days at home and they're using a Microsoft 365 platform. Um, how is she accessing materials because she, maybe she's a large print reader but is learning Braille and how is she receiving that Braille instruction if she's only at school two days a week. But we know for beginning Braille readers we typically need three days, I mean, we need five days of instruction. So how are we getting that instruction to her those other three days? And then another example student would be Brian. Brian's a high school student and he's proficient in UEB and Nemeth. And his high school is doing all their coursework um, through Schoology. And he's, he's a good braille reader. He's good with technology, but because he's um, in high school, he's also at high level math. And how are we providing that math um, in Nimeth code virtually? How is he getting access to everything that he needs virtually? Those are all challenges. Um, so the struggle's real. We all know <laughs> we're on the struggle bus together. Um, there isn't a one size fits all approach for our students who have a broad range of needs. Um, different states and school districts are divide, are just defining how services can be provided. So as, as those examples had, some are doing total hybrid and they're two days, two days. Some are doing um, everybody's in person and those that are choosing to do virtual are totally virtual. They can't receive in-person instruction um, and are participating with the live um, in-class sessions. Some are doing, um, we have some students that are receiving, they're all a virtual classroom. And so they're receiving instruction great straight to that virtual classroom. It's just so different. And everybody's calling it something different as well. Um, and then there are different distance learning platforms and applications used, and they each have their own accessibility challenges. Um, and teachers are constantly finding new apps, new extensions to try to push out um, interactive education activities, but then we have to address are they accessible or not? And if they aren't, what do we do for our students? Um, and that digital learning, it's evolving at such a rapid rate with there's new features and new things every week and how do we keep up with it? We, I mean, honestly, we can't, but that communication with our gen ed teachers is so important and with technology um, departments to work through that. Um, so what we're gonna what we're gonna start with is um, doing some breakout session um, and talking about with each other. Um, since the platform, I don't know how many people we've got like fifty five participants per, participants right now. So that's too many to uh, to all of us just jump in in this big form. But what I'd like for us to do, and so you have some interaction with um, different people that are attending, and I know we have people from different states and potentially different countries joining in. Um, we'll put you into breakout groups and for about 15 minutes, um, and we'll do, let's see, there's 55, we'll do groups of about um, seven to eight people in them. Um, and do some brief introductions, just who you are, where you teach, um, what your role is, what population you work with. Perhaps you're in a, a life skills classroom or you are an itinerant TBI or you're an o and -er. um, And then have someone volunteer to serve as a recorder for your group. And then as a group, share what have been your biggest struggles with distance education? What? What has you beating your head against the wall um, on how do I fix this for my kids, for my students? My students are the ones that I feel like are, um, are missing out and how do I give them access? So share those as a group and then we're gonna report back to the full form, have that one recorder report back to the full form on 
what are your, what are the top five struggles you as a group decided on the things that are hardest um, for your group? We're going to jot those down and, um, and then we're going to break out again and try to discuss some of those. Um, you know, I'll share some of my ideas before we break out, but I am, and I may, Bev, help me Bev, because she's the, our tech guru on here. I have some suggestions, but then also I know all of you have ideas and suggestions, things that you have tried that didn't work, things that you have tried that have been amazing um, and have worked well for your students and for their classroom teacher. Um, and we'll share some of those. And what I will be doing, and, um, and the reason I'm sharing this is a smaller screen instead of a full slide, is we will jot those struggles down. Again, I will upload this slideshow again after today so that you can review back on what other people's struggles have been and we will on another slide add what some of our solutions are um, whether it's resources or just things that you have tried um, so that we all have a document we can refer back to and oh somebody said some website they used or some app that they used what was that called um, so that we can have a, have a place to to look for those resources so Lisa's going to break us all up into some um, breakout rooms. Again, introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, what you do, and then and then share with your group what your struggles have been. Okay, 15 minutes. Welcome back. And I think there's been a few people join us since we went into the breakout rooms. Um, and I probably should have made that longer time. I'm um, <laughs> new to doing this thing, so. You needed more than 15 minutes. I'm sorry, that's my fault. Um, our next time we'll have more time. <laughs> our next um, thing we'll have more time. Um, so, oops, get back into the Zoom and um, share my screen again. Okay, so wanted to just kind of have the opportunity to, to meet some people from some different places. And um, I was excited the group I was in had some out of state folks. So um, that's not common for our Indiana conference. I think that's one advantage of us being virtual this year is we're able to hear what some other states and other people are doing. Um, and so I thought what we would do is go through and um, kind of talk about what are the struggles that people are having? What are some of the things that you are seeing that are difficult in your district? So if you are the spokesperson for your little group, um, see who, um, whoever wants to jump on first, that's a spokesperson and would like to share some of the that you're having um this is karen ennis um Hi, karen. we said technology for the blind it's not as hard for the low vision as much as it is for the blind what's accessible having the technology or teaching the technology or just all of it in general all of it in general okay um because sometimes it's a matter of having the technology available sure um, the other one was keeping track of everyone's schedule, like who's on virtual, who's in, if you're in multiple districts, which district is doing uh, virtual, which district is doing brick and mortar, which district is doing hybrid. Right. Um, the younger students with blind and teaching braille, if they're virtual. The other one was um, parents' knowledge of all of the technology or their su the support for them. Um, not so much that they are not, not smart, it's that they just don't know this technology or it's new stuff that they are not familiar with. And then um, we were talking about sometimes with a language barrier if you've got an ESL student who is also uh, visually impaired or blind. Okay. I can go next. Okay. Um, my name is Wendy Stoltman 
And our group, um, the things that we identified as um, seesaw not being accessible for kids who um, are blind. Things are embedded, they're not accessible with voiceover. Um, kids um, actually regressing in their uh, orientation and mobility skills because lessons are only allowed to be virtual. And um, the last one was um, the same thing that um, Karen just said about um, early intervention and teaching Braille uh, and um, doing those lessons virtually and even getting the materials and the equipment to the families are hard. All right, thank you. This is Carissa Reed and in our group, we talked about a couple of things. I totally agree with the, um, where you don't know what district is doing what, because some of us that do multiple districts, you get all the way up there and, oh, they're quarantined or they're doing this. And so we've just had a lot of um, challenges on that as well. But one of the things that was the struggle for virtual was um, their home life. And they were um, more concerned with trying to um, not let you see, I guess that lens into their home life because it was stressful and there was swearing and you know what I mean? And they were more embarrassed and not focused on the learning. Um, one thing that I had just been told this um, semester, I've been a teacher assistant for 19 years, was that children with IEPs, even if we go to an all e-learning situation, the children with IEPs can still come into the school and receive their services. No one in my group had heard that. I'm curious whether anybody else on here has heard that. Okay. Yeah, that's the same for us in our district. We're in Michigan. So we, we did the same when there were many kiddos at home. Ours were in face-to-face uh, -face because of the IEP. Yeah, and I think, I think different districts and different states are interpreting that differently. Um, so I know for our district, if, um, if a student is attending virtually, they're required. Now, they have the choice to come to school. So they can come to school or attend virtually. And if they, if the family chooses virtual, then all instruction is virtual. Um, and so I, I think that's, I think that's kind of a district by district decision. And they talk through that with their legal counsel. But I, I think we know, I don't think it's landed on anywhere or there's been, I have not heard of any, you know, state mandate or um, or guidance from the state or federal government on what that's supposed to supposed to look like. Um, I mean, I think they're supposed to be receiving services, definitely, uh, the services that are in their IEP, but I don't think, I don't know, that's a good question. And I'd love to hear what anybody else has heard. And that may be something we can talk about in our groups as we break up into go, we're going to Kind of look at some of these things and then break back out and talk about if you have any strategies or ideas on what to do with these we'll talk about them further um is there another group that has what where there's wants to see, share some struggles this is Kara. Oh, sorry okay. <laughs> this is Kara hecht and i'll hurry and share what we had on our group um one of the big ones uh that we talked about is people just not signing in or attending their sessions <laughs> yes like us showing up and on the other end they just never show up or it's hard to get a hold of them um if they're not showing up to figure out what's wrong um troubleshooting devices has been something that has come up it's hard to do virtually um yes. telling somebody how to troubleshoot and know what's going on um teaching physical tasks at a distance sometimes feels impossible like for orientation mobility um communicating to somebody else how to teach a physical test to a student um it, it proves to be challenging um not only that but doing those tasks communicating to students or staff takes significantly longer virtually than it would in person there's a lot of extra steps you have to do it takes a lot more time um, the last one that we had was with all that is piled on teachers' shoulders, general education teachers, 
Um, with all that's piled on their shoulders right now, the accommodations for our students are kind of an afterthought, something that I have had to really um, shout out for and give extra time to to get because there's so much on their shoulders already some of the accommodations are becoming an afterthought and it's hard to get those when they are juggling so much so many other things right now thank you yes i concur on several of those who else um the thing that we had talked about kind of in our group was functional vision assessments oh, virtually okay. Um, some things um, probably can be done remotely, um, different, you know, scenarios, situations, you know, can the student come in, um, but just kind of some of those finer pieces, like mm, the distance side of yeah. things, um, you know, how much can you do coaching a parent through, how much, um, anyway, that was just kind of like the, the overall theme of, of ours was. Sure functional vision assessments, especially as we move forward, you know, in your 50 day timeline. Yes. Getting all that stuff done. Yes, definitely. Who else? Um, our group, this is Mandy Narcarati. Our group talked about a few things that kind of went along with that not knowing everyone's schedule is that we also um, have a lot of schools on different um, e-learning platforms and trying to figure out what each school is using or what each teacher within that school is using can be kind of exhausting to keep up with that. And going along with that is that we don't always have training in all of the different platforms, especially if a teacher chooses one that's um, new or a little different from the school system. Okay. Who else? Anyone? I know the group. I oh, sorry. Go ahead. This is Angie Bassard, and um, in our group, we had also discussed uh, multiple issues um, with the student. For example, um, not necessarily multiple disabilities, maybe, but like behavioral issues or attention deficit hyperactivity, <laughs> things like that that can impact. Um, uh, a, a session with the student. Well, anybody else? I know in the group I was in, um, I'm running out of space. We also talked about, um, and I think somebody else mentioned this, O and M. How do we, um, you know, how do we serve students with orientation mobility? There's a gentleman here from the Raleigh uh, School for the Blind out there, and um, they've been doing virtual lessons, but haven't been able to see kids in person for O and M. And we're working on a model to to kind of do some of that going forward. Um, I, I'm an orientation mobility specialist and I didn't see kids in the spring. I fortunately have been able to this fall um, because we are back in person in my district, but um, I know other districts that's not the case. So that would be a different scenario. Um, I think just internet access um, for families, for some families that has been an issue. Um, we also talked about kids not signing in and just not showing up even for their lessons, gen ed and virtual um, special education students um, and not knowing what's going on and why. Um, and we'll also talk about braille for little kids, um, but that's tough. And then getting the right um, equipment in students' hands. How do, we, um, how do we do that? And I know our district has run into because nationwide there's been a virtual, um, so many people going virtual, there's been a shortage of Chromebooks and they couldn't find some of the large screen ones that we needed. Um, there was a certain model that, oh, well, you can get it in January. And I, nope, January's not gonna work. We need it now for students. So um, having to fund those things and find alternate sources or uh, alternate devices um, has been a challenge too. Does anybody else have one, anything else they want to share on challenges? There was, this Juline, I there was one other thing that 
since this school year started, I have had to quarantine twice, once ah. because I was sick and once because I sat next to somebody who tested positive. And, yes. and so then it's like a two week quarantine each time. So I've lost four weeks of, you know, working. Sure. Like, and, and even when I can work from home, it is not the same. And there's no other me in my district. So there's nobody right. to cover. Right. So like, that's a huge struggle. That's like who huge. is doing my job? Right. Oh, definitely. That is, that is huge. Um, and I know that's happening in a lot of places. Um, our district has had several staff members have to um, quarantine and fortunately I haven't yet, but the concern, and I, I think somebody else in my group mentioned, particularly for students with essential skills or, um, you know, with different medical issues, our concern of that we travel so many places and exposing those kiddos we don't want to bring something in from some place that we have been um, to um, and put them at risk. So that that is a big concern on how are we meeting those students' needs yet, um, but still also protecting them from everything that we're exposed to. Um, anything else? Other? Not that this isn't enough. <laughs> We've got a lot, you know, and I, gen ed teachers do too. But I think there's a lot here that people don't realize. Um, that administrators don't realize um, that we're having to deal with and um, you know and everybody's feeling isolated um, and not having resources that they need or somebody to just vent with about these kind of frustrations and so that was kind of the plan for this session is to talk about some of this um, you know to put it on paper and say these are the concerns that we have um, and then are there any um, are there any things that we can do to address this? Who has some ideas for some of these things that that will help? Because um, we all are dealing with a lot of the same things. We've heard several of them echoed um, from different groups. So um, I know so, there's a lot of you out there that have got great ideas for various things. So let's, let's kind of talk about that now. Um, we're gonna do breakout groups again Kind of think about some of these struggles. Um, technology, how are you dealing with technology um, and getting what students need, getting the training that you need. Um, if anybody's attended some great trainings that you can share with your group and that we can share back to the whole group. Um, resources that you you looked to. Um, you know, what are some, how do you, how do you keep track of what each district's doing? Um, and I think someone checked on the home life and, and family and not wanting to share what's going on. How do you um, help with students that you know things are struggle at home or that you suspect that because they don't have internet or because family doesn't want you to see what's happening in the home um, and getting materials to students. Some of those different things. Let's break out a little bit and talk about some strategies that you have used to address some of these various things that we've talked about here and um, and then we'll come back together again to go through some, some things that are working that you have found that work that address some of those various struggles. So I said, I thought we'd break out for 20 minutes, but let me see, we've got um, 30, we've got 45 minutes left. So let's break out for 30 minutes. Um, and how many, we've got 57. So we do groups of five to six again, so 10 groups. Um, and again, you may, you may be with all new people. This will kind of shuffle and sort people. So introduce yourselves again and where you teach and what you do and someone serve as your recorder. And then discuss at least three strategies that you found that work um, to address some of the struggles. Um, if you have time to do more, great. Pick some of those tough ones that we talked about in that great big long list um, and try to just dig in and, and if you haven't come up with something, what's something you've thought about maybe trying that, um, or that you've been afraid to try, but think might work. Um, and, and then we'll come back and share those and I'll share some things that I've done and, um, and you guys share some things that you've done so that we can share collaboratively what, what can we do to, to make things work for our students. So I think Lisa's gonna send us into breakout rooms.
So at least I changed that to 30. Um, yeah. 30 okay, I've got it set. And Okay, so I'm back, but it's passing period at the high school and I can't mute my music. So I apologize um, for the background groove going on, um, telling the students to get their rears to class. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again um, with some strategies. These are my personal, some things I've done, not definitely not everything. Um, but thanks, Beth. <laughs> it's nice, but it's loud in here when they start playing that music. You can't miss it. Um, there's no doubt it's telling you to get to class. <clears throat> These are, I mean, by all means, not everything, and it doesn't cover everything that we've talked about. But I wanted to share these first, a um, few things that have worked for me, and then we'll kind of I don't have a whole lot of time, only 10 minutes left, but um, a few people share any key points you have. And then I'm gonna put my email in the chat box. Um, I would love for you to, um, oops, let me get back to, let me get to the chat box. Um, share with me if we don't get to your group, um, additional things that you have found that work, trainings that work, um, things like that and email them to me and I'm gonna add them all to this document and then we'll reshare it back in sketch with, with updated information. Um, so it's Kay Crawford at cpcsc.k12.in.us. And I just put that in the chat um, and I'll put it on the last slide too. Um, but some things that have, that have worked for me, um, I know sometimes bridging that gap between the IT staff in the building that is not AT specialists, they're just IT specialists, they just don't get our assistive technology. And that, I have to let it go that that's okay, they aren't gonna get it a lot of the times, or you might find one in the entire tech team that gets it and then you bug that person to death. Um, but just demonstrating to them and the gen ed teachers, what isn't working. So and just telling them, well, that doesn't work for my student. Well, show them what's not working. Show them how when they switched to this other platform, um, what, what's not accessible. So that maybe coming up with alternate options or a solution, maybe they know another platform. Oh, I could be using Pear Deck instead of Kahoot or whatever, whatever the extension is, they may know of another extension that you can try that'll be accessible and they just didn't realize. Um, and so really working with them and educating them. Um, for students that are at home, delivering materials to at home, I've done that for braille, beginning braille readers, dropping off a bag. And, and it does take a lot of more prep as somebody mentioned before, it takes more on the front end before the lesson of labeling the page numbers, labeling, um, making flashcards and labeling them for the families, um, but then delivering that to the home and doing some role release and letting the parent help you, um, which then they learn, they learn a lot from that too. And so um, some of what I've used, I've used a um, swivel mount from iPad so it can view the parent can adjust it and it will view the Braille writer or it can view their their hands on the Braille page, but then they can flip that iPad up to then see what me demonstrating to the parent, what it should look like. Um, making sure if they're participating in Gen Ed that they have a set of manipulatives at home. Um, and, you know, at school we're making sure each, if they're using manipulatives, each kid has their own set. A lot of them, they. They, they're not using manipulatives because they don't want to share sets of manipulatives. So they're doing everything online. But is there a way to, okay, so just because you're doing it online with the whole class doesn't mean my student has to do the online version. I can give them the blocks or I can give them the tangrams to do it with the physical objects. Um, working closely with that parent to facilis facilitate instruction with possible and it may be scanning the environment for tools that we could use for our lesson that they have at home, particularly with, with kiddos with additional disabilities. 
what toys and things do they have at home that we could use um, in their, you know, that are in their environment that we could use to help with that lesson? Um, let's see what else. Um, their APH has a really large abacus that you can use for teaching. So that's something that you can easily show on the screen to a low vision student or to a parent if you're teaching it that way. Giving daily living skills as homework um, for virtual lessons. And I've had students talk about fire safety at the home and fire safety with cooking, um, doing things from the just reaching into your ECC. And I know in our group talked about for O&M really working on self advocacy and um, and what could you do um, giving this teaching the students scripts teaching them how can they call tech support and what information do they need to have to share with tech support about their device and how can they clearly describe the difficulty they're having so tech support can walk them through that's what they're going to have to do as an adult so starting that earlier and practicing that and role playing that with them um, Anybody, and then real quick, I'll show these two. Um, using school technology instructors, high school students that are really savvy, other students that are um, maybe tech savvy, maybe not, I, not AT savvy, but tech savvy might be able to show you some things. Former students, reach out to your former students that um, are using those devices that you're like, I don't have enough time with this device to help troubleshoot it with my student that's virtual, but one of your former students or a blind or low vision adult might be able to help you. Um, the Patents Project, definitely reach out to them here in Indiana, and they have a great new series on creating accessible documents um, that can be shared with, you can sh roll release, share it with the gen ed staff. It's quick, easy ways for them to make sure the documents they're sharing with your students are accessible. Um, if you aren't a member of the Teachers of the Blind and Visually Impaired Facebook group, lots of good questions on there and from people all over that are sharing. Um, you post a question and you'll get lots of responses to that um, and ideas. And if you don't get the, the Perkins Path to Technology, if you're not on their website and get their, their email list, they are putting out things with regard to virtual learning on a fairly regular basis on um, being able to, oh yes, yeah, somebody shared Veronica with four eyes. Um, she is an amazing, um, so she is a student with low vision. She's in um, college and she is studying um, and she gives great ideas. And it's, um, she has a blog that you can follow. And um, yes, yeah, she's, I agree, she's awesome. So, um, so share that, you know, if you have some things like that, that you are willing to share, um, email those to me, send them to me. Um, and we've just got a couple minutes left, so I don't want to take up more of your time, but um, if anybody has something like urgently, they'd love to just pop on and share right now. And then otherwise, like I said, I will gather more information and share out with anybody, but any great just brilliant ideas that anybody had out of their groups on um, that you want to share now or just email them to me. Anybody? Bueller? I know in our group we talked about, you know, the role release, being willing to let go of some of it. Um, being also be is that a battle you want to fight on certain things? Okay, so the student isn't assigning it, signing in and doing their attendance question, but they are getting their work done. Um, then can we waive, can we waive the attendance question? Because maybe they're having difficulty accessing it, but they can get their work done. Um, hey, Katie. Yes, Miss Julene, we had put a couple links in the group chat of some things that might be solutions. Oh, um, awesome. In, in the chat for this, let me see. Hang on. Yeah, there was the um, Ron had a uh, parent mobility calendars, calendars to link, and and I shared a 
folder of O&M activities that could be done as like a daily homework for O&M. Okay, and super. the parents could record. But Wonderful. Um, thank you. Need to exit out of door four of the I don't know where those came from. I didn't make them. I okay. just download them. <laughs> okay. So I'm not claiming ownership. No plagiarism here. That's that's but all right. It's just a resource I found. We're good at you know share. That's what we need to do is sharing those resources because we all are feeling stretched thin and not enough time to come up with solutions on our own. So we need to lean on each other and find out what's working for other people. And don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Um, Cause even those of us that have been here a long time, I don't know on some of this and I cannot keep up with the technology and it's okay. Um, I think giving, I think somebody else said, giving yourself grace and giving others um, grace and, and patience. Um, we need that even more so now than um, than we did before this whole craziness started. So um, reach out um, and please do some, uh, we'll try to get the information from the chat. I think Lisa, is there a way for us to cat, cat, capture all that? Save that as a file yeah, or something? That is a really good question. I think I can kind of do it in a way that's not intended. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We can capture all that and then I, I will make sure to add that and, um, and then if anybody wants to email me anything, um, again, I'll put my stuff here in the last box. Um, email me stuff that you've got, and then I will add it to this and have it all added by the end of next week. So that would give everybody um, time to, to put things, you know, if you've got things in. Um, thank you all for attending. It was really neat to have a very diverse group and um and share if nothing else to know you're not alone and we're all sharing similar frustrations um and that there are some solution, solutions for some things so have a good rest of the conference enjoy um lots of good speakers so thank you for joining in thank you katie that concludes the session please complete evaluation to receive your professional growth points or a c b r e p c e u s and to be entered into a prize drawing at the end of the conference the evaluation link can be found in sched or use the link provided in the chat the ending code for pgps or a c v r e p c u c e u s is shop s h o p to leave this section click leave